There is a question that every generation must answer. They must. And that question is the title of the message. Just who was Jesus? And, and I'm talking about the Jesus of the Bible. Just who was Jesus anyway? It's a question that's unavoidable. It can't be bypassed. It can't be sidestepped. To the person who says, I know how I'll deal with it, I'll ignore it. Well, in fact, you have dealt with the question by choosing to ignore it. I got to tell you, the consequences of that are devastating. Devastating. Now, what's interesting to me as we look at this passage, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 28. That's the only verses we'll be looking at. The assessments of people in our day as to who Jesus is and was, are very similar to those in his own day. It just amazed me as I looked at this. We're going to see how his family, his foes, and his followers evaluated him. We begin by noting his own flesh and blood. You're in Mark chapter 3. Look at verse 20. Then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. But when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him. For they said he is out of his mind. So to his family, he was demented. He was demented. You would think that the closest allies that Jesus would have had would have been his own family, right? Don't we generally suppose that? It's not always the case, I know. I realize that. But at least theoretically, should that not be the case? We can count on our family. They'll be there for us. Jesus under the power of the Holy Spirit, was performing miracle after miracle after miracle. Incredible things were taking place. This might have been one of the real high points in the ministry of Jesus. He is becoming very, very famous in that community, in that region, in that area. Everybody's talking. So much, in fact, that when he comes through an area, the crowds are so huge, they are so big, as we noted in the text, they can't even find a place to eat because of the masses of people.
when it speaks of his own people. It's talking about his family. His family. Now we know from other places that they were some of the last people to come on board. Was that because growing up they saw something in Jesus that made them doubt who he was? No. No. Our Lord Jesus Christ was perfect. He was born perfect and he stayed perfect until he died on a cross. That's when he took our sins. He became sin for us. Was that what it was? No. No, it wasn't that he had did things that made them doubt. They just couldn't believe it. They couldn't accept it. They grew up with him. They had did a lot of things that young people do together. And now, now they hear about miracles being performed. And people are talking, is not this the promised one? Can this possibly be the Messiah? How do they react? They went out to get him to kind of lock him up, basically. He's beside himself. He is out of his mind. They considered him to be deranged. Makes no sense whatsoever. None. They considered him irrational. I said a moment ago, theoretically, your family should be those who are always there for you. But the sad thing is, we know that's not always the case. It didn't. It was certainly not the case in Jesus' life. To his family, he was a deranged individual. He was one who needed to be committed. There were no institutions in that day and time, but they did have places for those who would fall into this category. Evidently, they were looking. They were looking. Second, that's his family. To his family, he was deranged. To his foes, he was demonic. He was demonic. Our focus now shifts from the family of Jesus to those who were out and out enemies of Christ. Notice the accusation of the scribes. Verse 22. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said... He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of demons, he cast out demons. Now, how do we know so much about the scribes? They are mentioned often. They are normally mentioned with the Pharisees, the scribes and Pharisees, right? It's a common thing. We read it all through Scripture. What did a scribe do? A scribe was someone who hand wrote the law, the Old Testament law. They didn't have a New Testament. They were making the New Testament as they lived. But they had the Old Testament laws and writings. And they hand wrote them. There were no printing presses. There was no way to mass produce what we would refer to as Bibles. It was impossible. It had to be handwritten. And the person who was a scribe 
had to be a very astute in Scripture. By the way, if you ever feel that there is a contradiction when people say that the Word of God is inspired and that it has no error whatsoever, if you ever feel or hear someone say that, to me, these scribes are one of the clearest cases of all. Would it not have been easy? They've been working hours and hours and they've been handwriting Scripture. Would it not have been easy to have missed something? I've always felt that just as God the Holy Spirit guided those men of old when they spoke prophetic things, that God protected His Word as these scribes were writing. That's my case, how I believe. But that was their job. They hand-wrote the Word of God. Now, when they show up, they attribute the miracles of Jesus to satanic power. He performs these miracles through satanic power power. Now, there was a lot of questionable things going on at that time, especially as you move into the book of Acts. There were these magicians and all these others who evidently were enabled at time with satanic power to be able to duplicate miracles. They had to operate within certain bounds as God permitted or allowed them. But it's very true that there was satanic power. And when they hear of the miracles of Jesus, they attribute the miracles to satanic power. He was some kind of wizard or something of that sort. But they went beyond that. They went beyond just attributing what Jesus was doing to satanic power they attribute it to Satan himself. When it says he does this of Beelzebub, that's another reference to Satan. They were actually Satan that he does this through and by Satan. What an accusation. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Nothing. I've always thought it was interesting. They couldn't deny the miracles. They couldn't. I love it at times in Scripture when Jesus performs a miracle. And there's a group there who are, who are trying to write it off in some way. I love it in the case of the man who was paralytic. He said, well... The bottom line is this. Is it easier to say thy sins are forgiven or to rise up and walk? And he tells the man, get up and walk. And he gets up and walks. That's proof. That's evident. There's nothing to deny that. They could not deny the miracles that there were those who had leprosy and they were now cleansed. There were those who could not walk. They were paralyzed. Now they could walk. There were those who could not see. Now they could see. They couldn't deny that. So what they did was concocted their own slant by coming up with such incredibly foolish things as he's doing this empowered by Satan. So to his family, he was demented. To his foes, he was demonic. The accusation of the scribes. Second, look at the answer of the Savior. Christ comes back. First, he makes an inquiry. 
I like this, verse 23. And he called them to himself and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? He asked the question point blank. Can Satan cast out Satan? Now the answer to that is obvious. It's ridiculous. That was the inquiry of our Lord. It didn't even need to be answered. It was already answered. Satan cannot cast out Satan. Next, he gives illustrations. His first illustration is a secular one. Look at verse 24. If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. When he's talking about a kingdom, he's talking about a country, a world power. And we've seen this down through the years. Anytime that our own country has ever been involved in a war that involved a country which was divided, it was always problematic. Look at Korea. We lost a lot of good men and women in Korea. And Korea is still just as divided today as it was then. Moved to Vietnam, same thing. We lost thousands of men and women. And you think about those that lost their lives, gave their lives there are equally that many more who still suffer from the effects of Vietnam today. And you go on past that, go into the Middle East where there is a north and south, they are fighting. It's impossible to win those kinds of wars because they are political wars. It's impossible where you have an enemy out there who is designated, you know who that enemy is, that's one thing. I've talked to a lot of our people who were in Vietnam. And because they look so similar, you never knew if you were fighting an enemy or an ally. And they would use whatever they could, trickery or anything else. Because the goal was to destroy America. So he gives a secular illustration. Can a country which is divided stand? No. You say, well, Korea is still around, Vietnam is still around. And they are shambles, both of them, both of them. And might I say this, with nuclear technology, they're some of the most dangerous places on the face of the earth, especially when you have leaders like Korea does. A social, secular illustration. Then he gives the social illustration, verse 25, and if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. Now he moves it down to the family. A family that is segregated, that is divided, it's all kinds of problems. It's trouble. I think one of the most important things, ingredients for a family is unity. Unity. And unfortunately, it seems to be one of the areas in which Satan has attacked more today than at any other time. You know why Satan wants to get into the family? Because if he can get into the family, if that family is involved in church, then he's going to get into the church. Division. Can a family which is divided stand? No. 
No. Eventually it will fall. So he gave a secular illustration, a social illustration. Then he gave a spiritual one. Look at verse 26. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. He has an end. If Satan wars against himself, what will the end result be? There will be no more Satan. That's exactly what the text said. He will have an end. But Satan doesn't do that. Satan does not war against himself. But that's what they were saying when they were accusing the Lord Jesus Christ of performing miracles based on the power of demonic presence. Beelzebub himself, Satan. They were saying, we believe that Satan is using this Jesus. And Jesus said, will Satan fight against himself? No. No. Jesus' inquiry. Then notice his inside. I've always loved the inside of Jesus. Verse 27. No one can enter into a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Interesting. If someone wants something that someone else has, and that person who has whatever that person wants, has it in their house, he knows to be able to get or achieve what he wants, he must break into the house. Right? That's basically what Jesus is saying. Now, if the one who owns the goods is in the house, then he must first subdue the homeowner. He must, that must be the first thing that he does. Before he can get what he wants, he's got to get the homeowner out of the way. And that's what Jesus said. He will bind him. He will plunder him. He will tie him up. He will deal with him first. Then, when he has succeeded in doing that, he will go into the house and he'll get what he wants. Right? His insight. To rob someone, that person must first of all be Subdued. So, who was Jesus anyway? Well, to his family. To his family, he was this irrational, demented person. And I said in the very introduction that the answer, the assessments of who Jesus was in his day, are still around today. There are those people today who know enough about the Bible to know about the miracles of the Bible and know whom Christianity promotes him to be, the Savior of the world, who will openly come out and say he was nothing but a madman who had some good ideals, but in the end he lost. He was killed. He lost. Now they don't go any farther than that because we know what happened when the world took his life. They could not keep him dead. He arose victorious. We sang about it this morning. Victorious over death, hell, and the grave. They don't go that far. They just say he was a man who probably had some good ideals. He's left a legacy behind of some things that we should consider following, 
But was he the savior of the world? No. No. They equate him to just some crazed madman who wanted to be famous. Much like a Hitler or someone like that. To his family, he was demented. To his foes, he was demonic. What he did, he did through the power of Satan. Makes no sense whatsoever. If you consider this on the front, based on what we know about Satan, would Satan ever have in his heart a desire to touch the eyes of someone who was blind and make him see? No. That's not the profile of Satan. And all the other miracles, would Satan speak from outside of a grave and call forth a dead man? Would he? No. No. That is not the profile of Satan. So it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Family, he was demented. To his foes, he was demonic. But I like the last verse. To his followers, he was divine. Look at verse 28. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatsoever blasphemies they may utter. I'm going to stop there because... It moves from there into a place where Jesus does mention one sin that cannot be forgiven. We don't have the time, believe me. It might be a good study sometime. The only sin that Jesus will not forgive. Most of you know what that is. That's the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. But we're not going to go. It, 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 it's... It's a session within itself. But I said to his followers, he was divine. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men. Aren't you glad that he can forgive all sin? Every single one of them. No matter how rotten, how wicked, that we have been, no matter what our lifestyle was like before Christ, He can forgive every one of them. Every single one of them. And we gather, we assemble in this place this evening as forgiven sons of God. And we revel in the fact that we have peace in our heart that our sins are forgiven. Our sins, which were many, have been washed away, cleansed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. What an incredible thought to His followers. Those of us who are saved, He is divine. He's divine. Every generation must deal with this question. Who was Jesus anyway? Depending upon your perception of who He was, in the end, at the end of your life on earth, it will determine your future destiny. Will you go and be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever? Or will you die lost in your sins because you failed to accept Jesus for who Scripture says that He is? 
That determines eternal destiny. And I would challenge you and I would challenge anyone watching this evening. If you have never put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, do that. Reach out to someone in whom you have confidence. Say along with that jailer years ago, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? I promise you it'll be the best decision that you ever make. Amen? All right, let's stand to our feet.